Welcome to the Lighthouse Conversations, a podcast featuring entrepreneurs and tastemakers from the world of arts, culture, tech, and of course, food. I'm your host, Hasha Montasir. If you're listening to us for the first time, you can follow the show on your favorite podcast player, such as Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Just hit the subscribe button to get notified of new episodes or visit thelighthouse.ee slash podcast to see any of our previous shows. My guest today is Isabel van der Einde, one of the pioneering women in the regional art scene. In 1996, Isabel opened one of the first contemporary art spaces in the UAE, B21, before moving and launching her current gallery, IVDE, in 2010 as one of the early movers in Al Cerkel Avenue. For more on the evolution of Al Cerkel Avenue and their vital role in the Middle East art ecosystem, listen to my episode with Vilma Jurkete, the director of Al Cerkel. Since launching 11 years ago, Isabel's gallery space has become renowned to the UAE as well as internationally as the home of many leading artists including Hassan Sharif, Mohammed Qasim, Rokni and Ramin Harizada and Hissam and many others. IVD is known for its thought-provoking shows, oftentimes pushing the envelope by reminding us why contemporary art, in fact any kind of art, is so essential to life and to living. Isabel, you and I have started a conversation, I feel, I don't know, I don't want to reveal how old we are, but maybe a decade plus ago. When I met you, you had just moved to Al Cerkel from your previous location. But let's start from the beginning for a minute uh, with your first gallery and your first location. You showed up in Dubai and did you just one day decide, I want to do this and found the location and started the gallery? How did it all come together in the very early days of, of the Dubai kind of art evolution? Actually, I'm, I just met with some artists and then the journey happened with the artist hand in hand and we constructed that together. Who were the original artists that you met that gave you that impetus? So I met with them in Iran, okay. in Tehran. And I, after I've met them for the first time, I continued traveling there and um, I was trying to create a platform. And um, slowly, slowly, there's been a lot of uh, curiosity around that. And uh, yeah, and then, uh, as I said, I, we built it all up together, hand in hand. And did you sort of day one, I'm going to just ask some specific questions because it's very possible that there are some listeners out there that are interested in starting their own art gallery. Uh, you have a very successful art gallery and practice for a long time now. You started in 2006? Yeah, a bit earlier because we earlier. were showing in... Various uh, places. Yeah, various spaces that were not attached, that were not galleries. There were no such platforms. Yeah, so you started, you know, let's, let's just call it 15 plus years ago, which there were very little here in terms of certainly platforms and spaces to showcase art, most certainly contemporary art as we know it today. Did you feel it was a passion for art? I mean, was there something that was always with you even before the gallery? or more relationship-driven in terms of the people you met? No, I've always been involved in, in art and the, the sharing of art. In Brussels, I was involved in a place called 20 Square Meters of Contemporary Art, which was really a lot of fun and uh, very successful at the same time. Um, yeah, my wedding gifts were artworks, you know. <laughs> this was always part of your journey. You launched, when did you know that you had something? I never thought of it in these terms. <laughs> okay. um, what is very important for me is to remain faithful to the artist's ideas and uh, to not compromise them at any stage. And when I have something, is because there is a chemistry between the artist, his ideas. His or her. Yeah, female, yeah, 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 of course. And um, and uh, it's about that chemistry. But after that, if there is recognition, success or, or whatever you, you would call it, that is really a collateral effect, I would say. That makes a lot of sense. So that uh, then going to take us to a topic that I was going to touch on a bit later, but we'll speak about it now since you brought it up. Obviously, you have a number of very successful artists that you uh, have worked with and continue to work with. Uh, Rockney, Ramin, and Hissam come to mind. Um, 
a number of Emirati artists uh, that have become quite prominent over the years. Obviously, as you well know, I have a very soft spot for Hassan Sharif, and you have had a long-standing relationship with him uh, before he passed away. Can we use that as an example just to zoom in into that kind of gallerist-artist relationship? How did that come about, your relationship with Hassan, uh, and then starting to showcase his work? First, I have to say that I'm really passionate about all the artists that I represent. No, no, sure. I'm just using one example to yeah. just kind of define it a bit more. And in terms of Hassan Sharif, Hassan Sharif is a life-changing uh, encounter in my life and I think uh, in the life of many people. Yes. Just this morning I was feeling stuck about something and then what I do is I go back to his uh, writings and things become clear and more simple. He's, he's more than the artwork. The artwork, if you take it, he like ties rope uh, or jute around cardboard, but actually it's the entire philosophy that goes with it that is um, more like a life philosophy, also changed the way I understand art and me as a human being, how I react to certain situations. The distance he has helped me to understand. It's like more than art. It is more than the object. It is a, it is a way of thinking. No, 100%. I think uh, you said it very well. I think, especially in Hassan Sharif's case, it really is almost a, a life philosophy. Um, when I first saw his work, uh, that's how it struck me. A few things struck me, actually. And I, I saw his work before uh, I met him in person. And I was very awed by it. A, it struck me, even at the time, and this was you know 15 years ago, very ahead of his time. Felt very avant-garde, very ahead of his time. When I dug deeper, and a lot of it was thanks to you, because I think you were extremely helpful in helping me and may understand his practice better. If you recall, and we spent about, I think, almost a year researching with you. I mean, you know, going back and forth and having a dialogue. But I was just very struck about the kind of work he was doing, which really was, was uh, very different. In your case, was it the work that you saw first, or was it Hassan that you met first? So what was the first impression? It's when I combined both okay. that I understood, you know... The totality. How, yeah, that I understood the value of it. And I think uh, you cannot distinct his work from, from who him. he was. And um, but he was a great thinker. And um, I used to visit him twice or three times a week because he wouldn't have a car or phone or a computer, an email address. <laughs> at, the, things, at the Flying House. Yeah, at the Flying House, so, um, which moved from Satwa to uh, Barsha. And um, yeah, so the way to, to discuss with him was uh, to meet with him in person. And uh, that was, uh, yeah, a few years of uh, enlightenment. And what struck you the most? Because surely through Hassan, you also started meeting other Emirati artists because they were in some ways like a collective, you know, and there were, you know, a number of them, many of them um, artists and painters, but some of them were poets and, and writers, etc. So what struck you there? Because this is essentially, and that's now been documented, it wasn't at the time, really at the very early days of building an art collective, uh, genuine Emirati art collective uh, from the bottom up. Yeah, um, this didn't exist when I uh, did it. I mean, it's there. It's in their DNA, I think. But it was not not anymore the case when I met with Hassan Sharif. So uh, after that, I've looked back at history to understand you, um, the dynamics between the artists. But uh, it's true that Mohamed Ahmed Ibrahim was there a lot. He was just a good friend sure. of Hassan. Um, Mohamed Kazem. Kazem. Uh, of course, uh, but they were not uh, working as a collective anymore. They had all taken an individual path and uh, practicing their work individually. And tell me about the first show, because I remember it very well, that you put out for Hassan. Walk us a little bit through it, and maybe then people can go on your website and actually find, find it, hopefully. But I'm just curious as to how did that come about to take those particular artworks? Because as you said, he was very prolific, and his, his work uh, uh, encompassed many different styles. 
Um, what made you zoom into that, you and him? He was prolific, but it depends on uh, which periods of his life. So, for example, what we call the semi-systems, which are um, uh, drawings that are ruled by um, arithmetic rules that he set up for himself as constraints to overcome, of course. Um, uh, it is very surprising that it's the same artist that produced these kind of... Uh, Random, uh, very, you know, rough objects. And somehow I wanted to reconcile both. And um, I understood, you know, what was the common denominator between those works. And I wanted to show it. And uh, What he, is the common denominator between those? Sorry to interrupt you. So in, in, your his, view. in his objects, whether they, he also applies a method. So in that method, he will decide, okay... I cut three times uh, through uh, four cardboards. Those cardboards, I will fold it three times to the right, dig it one time here, and he will work a system. And you see the system more clearly in his drawings, where you have a matrix, where you have a grid. You see the little rules and the command, the mistakes he makes. And it's all more explanatory in the drawings that are of a minimal aesthetic. And then when you see them the heaps or the, the wall-mounted uh, sculptures, it looks very uh, form and shapeless. But yet, there is a system that decided on the outcome of the work. So somehow, for him, it was always a way to... to it's a, he was a very humble person, um, and he didn't want art to be understood as something extraordinary. He wanted everybody to feel that he could and that everything would be would could be art so anyway so he wanted to remove that sacred that away from art all the time so he was playing a lot with these things so basically in the works we just described there's a system that system is a set of aleatory rules and whether it's in three dimension or on a two dimensional work of paper there are a set of rules that will somehow dictate the the final result. I remember acquiring one of those from you, and and there were three parts. There were the original documents that that started with the semi systems, and then there were the frame paperwork, and then there was the three D you know sculpture element of that work as well. Yeah, and that is actually a work he made for the show. It was called Seven Angular Points. It looks super complicated. There are like eighty three. Uh, draft papers, but somehow in his um, 11 drawings that he chose out of all his experimentation uh, and permutation and complex, uh, they look complex, but they are kind of also at the same time quite simple. He chose a few that he would create as objects, as sculptures, and they are very beautiful. They are stunning. And, you know, two things struck me with this particular work. One was when I was researching it and looking um, at the Flying House and some of the works you had in your gallery, was when he would make an error and he would sort of scribble. And to me, I found that, and as I got to know Hassan later, I understood that a lot more, sort of sign of his humility, right? So there was always this humility, sort of, so the idea of a perfectionism of sorts, yet you can make mistakes, if I just sort of describe it in very simple terms. And the other thing that really struck me, and this goes through all his work in my view, was the incredible playfulness. So while many of the works addressed, you know, you know, maybe more serious issues, or there was always an underlying playfulness. And that you see across. I mean, you see it obviously very visibly in some of the cartoons he was drawing, but you see it also throughout all the work. And that always stuck with me, that interplay. It's almost as if every time you start taking the work, or maybe yourself very seriously, you have to step back and you find a tiny joke or, you know, fun element uh, packaged in. Yeah, he had a lot of humor and also a lot of irony. Um, about his political cartoons, he used to call them a negative irony because he felt like, you know, you see that it, it, there is some sort of a joke embedded in the drawing, but then people don't think further, you know, they stop there. And that's where he started really changing and leaving away uh, his uh, cartoons. And he thought that um, through his objects, he would create something that is much more provocative 
especially by the fact that it would be called art and that it looked like junk. And that was for him, um, that's where he, it was too straightforward, his political drawings. But playfulness, it's true. What I think he was the first one to enjoy that playfulness because the pleasure he had out of doing was very um, important. And in our essay for that show in 2015, which was uh, uh, titled uh, Approaching Entropy, we, uh, there is a sentence I really like where we say that he's inhaling and exhaling art and nothing would actually define, he would not say, when the work is finished out of, you know, he had a vision, this is how my work needs to be. He, it was because he wouldn't have any pleasure out of it or he would run out of materials or the room would be too small or he would be tired or he had nothing to discover anymore about that specific repetition. That would be um, something that we can now think about it as uh, how we deal with life. Well. Absolutely. Yeah, I think there was there was a really a brilliance when you put on a show like like Hassan's or others. Uh, so I recall also, for example, you know, the early shows of Rockne and Ramin, um, where you would literally transform the entire gallery, uh, and they were brilliant. I mean, they were brilliant for us. They were brilliant for our kids as well, which <laughs> was really enjoyed. I think, and I'm walking around. Um, walk us through how this happens. I mean, do they come to you and they say, you know what, Isabel, we're taking over the gallery. This is what we're doing. Do you come and say, guys, do, I mean, you know, I want to just understand a bit of dialogue between the gallerist slash curator and the artist and how this comes about. It comes about because we have daily conversations. And uh, with Rocky, Ramin and Hassam, when I say daily, it's twice daily. So it's organic. It's very organic, the development. Yeah. I mean, at the moment we are facing um, our March show is, can't, uh, is postponed. So... I had a few ideas. Um, I tell them about these ideas. They challenge me a little bit more. We go back and forth until we have a satisfactory solution. Also with Mohamed Kazem, he's very generous. He shows his new work. He comes every day at the gallery. So they're all um, so inspiring. And then uh, what is extremely important is to show their work with... Um, I'm extremely careful to um, present their work loyal to their ideas. Yeah. True to their essence, in a way. Yeah. The thing is that it's anyway not a um, unilateral type of conversation because they also are keen to hear my ideas and the way I perceive this and that decision. So I would say this is, it's a very organic Dynamic as so I was telling you, if you recall, uh, coming in here at the elevator, that I I always thought, since I've gotten to know you, that the type of shows you put on your gallery, and certainly the kind of artists you have as well, there is a very bottom-up perspective, which I really appreciate. As, frankly, also someone from the region, as an Arab, as someone that grew up here, not in Dubai, but in Egypt, um, I, it always struck me that you're not, you don't have that outsider perspective that sometimes galleries, I'm not saying that it's bad, but that I feel in many cases colors or influences, you know, certain shows. And I think from what you're saying, but correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of that comes from that constant conversation. So it's not that you're just reading or learning about an artist and then saying, you know what, this is the kind of show that we should put in. You're actually having that conversation with the artist daily up to the point where it organically develops into a show. Do you think that's the reason people like me and others have that feeling that's very bottom-up, it's very true to actually the essence of what these artists are trying to do? Well, I think you're, I mean, I think you're, you're right in everything you have described and maybe I shouldn't have so much to add because for me it's uh, more about, the, um, it's subjective, so it's the subjectivity and not the passport that you have. Um, 100%. And I think um, the confrontation of those subjectivities and the chemistry between uh, the artist and me and my team also and other people that help us and contribute ideas and, and uh, well, all that uh, will create probably ideas and projects and, and the way we want to present it. 
When we come back, Isabel shares her thoughts on the regional art ecosystem and how our program fits in. We also discuss how she's looking to overcome the challenges of the last 12 to 18 months and accelerate IVDE's mission in 2021 and beyond. This week, we're excited to announce our partnership with the local water company Monviso, who have signed up as our first sponsor. Monviso was actually founded by an enterprising Italian entrepreneur right here in the UAE and has evolved into one of the region's most popular mineral water companies sourcing its water directly from the Italian Alps. When I met the Monviso team, I immediately connected with their overall vision and I was very impressed by their determination to make giving back to the community an integral part of their mission. Through their extensive recycling program and their Take Water, Give Life initiative, part of the proceeds of every bottle sold goes as a charitable donation to Al Jalila Foundation to support its education and research. I don't know about you, but there's something extra refreshing about a cold bottle of sparkling water. Or is it mineral water? or is it very cold mineral water? Anyway, it's getting warmer here in Dubai, so you might want to stay hydrated. Stuck up on still or mineral water by using our exclusive Monviso discount code, Lighthouse10. Again, that's Lighthouse10. And you can redeem the discount if you go to www.store.monviso.com. Again, that's www.store.monviso, M-O-N-V-I-S-O.com. Welcome back. You're listening to the Lighthouse Conversations with my guest, Isabel van der Einde. Let's assume I'm an artist and I'm working with you and I come back and present you a certain works. And it's beautiful or very interesting, but commercially not attainable for whatever reason, right? So you're, at the end of the day, you're wearing multiple hats. You know, you're sort of the protector. Well, protector. You are a part of the funnel for the artist, but also you have a commercial endeavor to support so you need to sell those artworks and that's part of the job. What if you come in this hypothetical, but I'm just curious, and you realize, you know what, this is not going to sell. Do you go back and you say, you know, Hashem, um, no, we need to tweak this. Or do you put it out there anyway to please the artist and then hope for the best? How do you go about these situations? I don't care. <laughs> okay, good to know. <laughs> I care about, uh, I use my shows and, and to make a statement. Okay, but then, you don't care about what? Sorry, you. you don't care about the commercial aspect of it? Or of you don't, the show, yes. You don't care if it sells or not? I use the shows to make a statement, to okay. show the um, last project of the artist, what they have to say, what they have worked on, and... Hopefully it's very relevant and it sure. will engage in many conversations. Then, of course, everybody is welcome to ask more Chime questions yeah. and to ask and then to dig a bit further. And we will share works that might not be presented, but we do have works generally related to a major artwork. But I think for la my next show, I'm going to have a conversation, an eco between three big installations obviously the chances of selling a big installation are more limited limited but it's important to show you know those more risk-taking endeavor that the artist and if not in the gallery how how are we going to yes no th that i understand so if i have an annual program i would fully understand that you're seeing certain shows are going to be more conceptual they may not sell as well commercially, but, you know, we need to make that statement. That's part of your curatorial kind of, you know, practice. But ultimately, and I'm just pushing back because I'm very interested in this, um, the commercial isn't the commercial aspect in a way a gauge of success? In other words, let me give you an example. I own the lighthouse here next door. <laughs> you know, if the place is fabulous and the food is great, but there's no one there that comes and eats, you know, so I'm like sort of, you know, in that beautiful world of my own creation, I, I would imagine, uh, luckily I haven't been in that position, but I would imagine my instinct would be, you know what, I need to kind of tweak this because uh, if no one is coming, that means I'm doing something that is not working for the public and that's part of the job. So I'm just trying to understand how you would then measure, uh, have a measure of success. If again, we use this hypothetical example of zero sales, 
How would you do that? I hope this never happens, but I'm just, I'm pushing on this because it's, you know, it's an interesting subject. You know, like, how would, would you then be like, oh, it's a fabulous show because we made a statement, but guess what, guys? We didn't make any money. I mean, would that not be contradictory? I think you need patience. Okay. And um, maybe in the immediate result will not be there, but people will remember, and the next show might have maybe more pieces that are easier to collect and that's the moment where actually many people might decide to do, to do the move so um then i have huge trust in my artist okay. and uh, i know they are great and uh, i know that you cannot be great if you don't take risks and that means that we need to be patient and brace ourselves for maybe more uh, dry times and other times sure that are more Sure. No, no, I see your point. Now that you are very established and have had a big measure of success over the years as a gallerist and as a name, really, I mean, your gallery and your name is synonymous, I think, with, and I'm not saying this because you're here, because I've known you for a long time, really with, I think, very high quality. Um, everyone in Dubai that's sort of uh, interested in art, I think, understands and knows that very well. At this stage, um, do you go still... Finding artists, do artists find you? So I'm talking about new artists that you're taking on. How is that interplay? Well, I'm curious, and I think that everybody needs to reinvent themselves. That's true. You are definitely. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very bad quality. <laughs> oh, my God. I think it's the only good quality. I mean, I can tell you 20 really bad qualities I have. Um, but that one is I'm a good I'm hoping one. that I... I mean, it's just exhausting because there's never enough time in the day, and I'm not saying this... The cliche, honestly, to, to pick up all the stuff I want to pick up. So that's you answering the question yourself. Yeah, here we go. Fair <laughs> enough. But do you? So you you and so you basically it's it's an interplay, I suppose. I mean, some I'm sure you, a lot of people come to you. I'm sure you get a lot of inbound inbound interest. But obviously, you also travel and you go and you read and and so on. You talk to people and then you find an artist that you like and you bring it on. Do you have a limit? Well, I mean, I have a limit, which is my limit of time. And, and capacity, uh, I guess. Um, yeah, um, I would love to, you know, have you know new artists, and and I think this is uh, very important. Um, but I've not been actively looking for those. But I might have uh, periods where I'm more active about that. At the moment, uh, with our current situation, I would say that I might have laid low sure. <laughs> for the time being. And um, no, I, I remain extremely curious and I think that it's great to inject new um, dynamism into the gallery. And you've just touched on this uh, challenge. How have you dealt with this challenge? Because, I mean, you know, art ultimately, so much of it is visceral and, and you know, I mean, I used to, you know, come see you and I'll drop in and you'll show me things that you have and old things that you have and we'll discuss this and you'll say, come tomorrow and I'll bring it out and you can see it. Obviously, none of this was happening over this last year. How are you, how are you able to adapt your practice to, to, to that change? Hopefully not forever, but for that period of time. Yeah, I think uh, we took advantage of that period to develop more on the uh, technologies and tools that we had. And we had them already, but we kind of perfect them. And now if you ask for uh, information about a work, we have it uh, framed and framed on the wall, floating with a person in front, zooming in, zooming out, a little quote by the artist. So all that requires a huge amount of work. Production, so we've yeah. created all these tools. We have a, stu a photo studio, uh, a mobile f photo studio in which we invested a lot. Um, so this is... Um, this is all extremely practical. I think all of that was there, but now we have all these tools to help the um, collectors or curators, journalists to understand, to get a better idea about the works, even though if they might have come to the gallery before, that it remains tools that we share now with people. Will um, you continue having physical publications? Because I remember part do. of my most fun is I would like come and then steal all the ones that you have at the front. Well, I should steal, have. But. I should uh, actually. I was in a hurry, but I wanted to bring you the latest catalogs. And uh, thank yes, you. No, I, I didn't. I'm, I didn't insinuate. No, no. I can come and have them. No, no, no worries. No, I'll, 
send them to you tomorrow. Thank but you. I was just like more focused on. No, um, no, that wasn't my point. My point is, I, but part for me, I mean, somebody that loves just physical I publications. I attached to okay. this. Uh, okay. We still do for each show. We also um, uh, commission um, um, a critical piece of writing, which I think is very important. Very important. Yeah. Uh, we produce our own. Um, do you publish on your website as well? Those pieces or no? Um, now in our viewing rooms, we okay. have, you can go at the end and flip through the catalogs. Oh, that's so interesting. Okay. <laughs> and it's really nicely done. But um, somehow... All your shows are viewing rooms now online or the new shows? You know, my team is so motivated and had, has created all that, but I still need to go through uh, certain points and give the the green light for publishing everything yeah, yeah. but some uh, some are online but we okay. also have a new website which is really nice and and friendly for people otherwise i really um, miss the human interaction but i also thought um during that period it was not appropriate to kind of um submit pdfs and 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 bombard uh, potential collectors with works because I felt like um, the I mean the society was not there, yeah, yeah the society had other concerns who might know what the person was going through when he received a PDF full of work uh, <laughs> to, to offered for buying so that I think I thought I'm going to I'm going to just lay back lay down or lay low and wait for just. Wait yeah, for, for this for this to pass. Better, I mean, so, I think yeah. hopefully we're towards the end of the tunnel on this, and you know things will go back to some kind of normalcy uh, soon. Um, you were, and you just said so before. You were laying low or laying down. You can also <laughs> do that, frankly. I mean, you really, you know, <laughs> you know, during this I, period, I, I anything was, is permissible. I you know, laying low, laying down. <laughs> you know, I mean, feel free to do any kind of. You know, that's <laughs> perfectly fine. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> Were you, uh, you were very active. You were one of the first, if not the first, a gallery from the region to go to Art Basel many years ago. Um, two questions. One is, do you see yourself remaining this active in terms of representation globally for your artists through your gallery going forward? Secondly, do you think within the art world this setup will change? Because I remember at some point, just before COVID, where there was starting already to be a pushback. You know, people were saying, both, frankly, gallerists, artists, and collectors, you know, this is exhausting. There were like, you know, so many art fairs interspersed by biennales, interspersed by other offshoots, and the program became sort of like a rock star program where you were like shuttling from city to city. What are, you, what are your thoughts on this and this frenetic pace, and, and where do you see yourself in that ecosystem? Well, number one about your question about um, Art Basel, it has been a pivotal moment for the artists that we were presenting Correct. there. Uh, in, uh, but what is very important for me is it's great to be part of the bigger scene, the international scene, but I will always make sure to not compromise the vocabulary of your artists. Of my artists. So we will go uncompromised, and that's the only way we will, you know, uh, be showing our work. Um, otherwise, it is true that I, when I am too much in, into traveling, fairs and all that, I really miss these moments where... I think, I read, I converse with the artist, I understand the their process. project. Yes, and uh, sometimes uh, uh, the artists are very active, so they, you know, they, they are prolific, but also in thoughts. And I like to keep track with that. So when I'm too much in the planes or too much uh, hopping here and there, uh, somehow I have, a, I, I am, I'm distancing myself from the artist. So that is a problem because after that I need to catch up. Uh, what I believe is, um, for example, for Hassan century, Sharif, we work with a gallery in, in Paris, so I'm not really trying to show him in Europe. And we yeah, work- Yeah, they, they do that. Yeah, they do that, or sometimes You're also I working with a gallery in the US. One or two works, yes, with Alexander Gray in New York. So I believe that 
you know, when something happened in the US, I support him uh, or I receive a request. Well, I will contact him to work together on that. And um, yeah, I'm, I feel personally, but that again is very personal, very exhausted by willing to win on every board. So, and I believe in our scene. I have, I'm grateful for the support you said. It's been spotty, but in 10 years time, it's amazing what has been accomplished. I, I didn't mean spotty in a negative way. I meant that it, it's in development. That's what I meant. Yeah. I mean, certainly it's flourished compared to what it was yeah. 15 years ago, no for doubt. For sure. Yeah, but I'm very proud of our scene. And I think that if you go to El Cercal, the um, uh, shows in the gallery are of high quality. Each, uh, each gallery has a very different individuality, which I think is great. Um, there is a great offer, and the number of individuals uh, that support us is great as well. I'm very grateful for that. By uh, individuals, you mean collectors? or, or uh, But you, for example, you're curious, you come, you publish, you put our books in the lighthouse, uh, you invite me for, for a talk, you, you know the scene. And there are other people like you that have been supportive throughout these years. They know the history. Uh, Abdel Mulem al Serkal was just a Fantastic, yeah. landlord. He's become yeah. a huge patron. patron. Yeah. Yeah. In if, all the right um, ways. Yeah, absolutely. You can go to him if you um, have an artist that you see as a resident in his foundation for publications. They're always there to listen. But there are many private collectors also that are from here. I, I believe in our region. I believe in our own um, vocabulary, our own sen sen sensibilities. Sensibilities, yeah. Um, no, so do I. I agree with you. And I, I appreciate what you're saying because I, I think that I have also learned over the years that the form of support comes in many different ways. I mean, certainly, you know, buying art and, and supporting artists is one of them, but it's not the only one. So what I, was, I always try to tell people is, you know, some people get intimidated, you know, by the art scene, that there's so many different ways of doing that. Just showing up, as you rightfully said, in itself is an act of support. And I think that's how you grow this ecosystem, which I agree has grown tremendously. If I were, if you had a wish list today, as you look at that ecosystem as it grown, of one thing that you could add or do that would, you know, propel it into a higher, even higher level, what would that be? That's a difficult, a tricky question because that's of my job. Course, nothing, nothing, <laughs> nothing is, um, nothing is perfect as it is. But I think we are on the path, and there is the, we have the right energies, and um, to grow it further. And uh, yeah, I think uh, we are in the right direction. To be honest, I think uh, it's amazing. Um, when you think about the uh, Sharjah Art Foundation, 100%. I mean. Uh, we should really all make an effort to make sure that we go there at Every least time. once a month. Yeah. And uh, I learned so many things each time I'm going. Um, Sheikh Ahur is a visionary in everything she's done. And, and uh, Jamil Center is now there. And um, we all need to go there and be a good audience, you know, because uh, somehow with the pandemic, institutions have suffered hugely while they have also put tremendous effort to compensate and to offer their programs online. I, I'm very admir admirative of their efforts. What do you think going forward, let's say 2022 and onwards, and as artists start to also process these last two years, which have been very difficult on so many different levels, what do you think emerges out of there? Do you think it emerges? So there are several camps. One camp is sort of, you know, you're going to have this renewed energy, fiercenessness, boldness. Everybody will be out and about. There is a second camp of there. You will have this sort of almost sort of like post-traumatic syndrome, which will mean a lot more lethargy and, and, and negativity. Where do you sit in, in that uh, not wishful thinking, what you realistically think pragmatically will happen. Um, an interesting fact about that is that artists somehow live a little bit confined, you know. <laughs> and, they uh, have their own that, bubble, yeah. And 
For Rockney, Ramin and Hassam, it was great. They didn't, they, of course, there were, they were Zooms and all that, but they have um, enjoyed this time of being stuck at home and the, the studio uh, life was uh, very, very uh, prolific, dynamic and uh, creative, <clears throat> inventive as they, are, as they always are. But I think that was the case for most of our artists that they had very, very productive time inside their studio. And artists are very lucky ones in this, you know, in this um, situation because they like being in their studio and working with their materials, their readings. That was great for them. What about <laughs> you? Great, I don't know. For us that are more there, out, uh, more out there, um, what I wish or... What? No, where, where do you, I mean, how do you feel? I mean, you know... Going from here, do you feel like, you know, you want to kind of keep going and even maybe faster? Do you want to retrench? I mean, how are you looking at, at coming out of this period in terms of your gallery? I think the questions that are more vivid now that were brought uh, more vividly by the pandemic, I had those questioning before as well, you know? Okay. So I felt always very bad to... Uh, Shape works right, left, and I've, I, as I said, I have that um, that network of galleries that I like to partner with, so that I, you know, we kind of uh, limit. Um, yeah, you don't have to be everywhere. Footprint. Yes, foot, need to be. footprint is really something that traumatizes me, and I'm and I'm very concerned about you know this whole question about uh, the planet. Um, so. This was already up in the air, but I think um, I think um, I'm, I'm just going to continue doing what I do with more content, more meaning, and more depth in the way uh, than what I was doing before. You know, I want to thank you for 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 everything you've done. To be honest, to help this art scene, I've seen it for many years develop, and you are very much front and center, and I think continue to do that and. You don't try to um, uh, simplify it, but you you know you you kind of I think understand what it takes. If people want to know more about your gallery and your artists, where's the best place for them to go? Um, well, to El Cercal, I guess. Um, I meant yes. online. I mean, I guess <laughs> yes, that too. But for those that maybe uh, don't live in Dubai, or I mean, you know, is your website the best resource? Yes. Where, where do they find the most information? I guess that's the question. Yes. Uh, yes, on the website, and they can reach out uh, <clears throat> if they have questions. There's so much material online. Are you now open at normal hours again? Yeah, yeah. Or completely, the okay. Usual. And do you plan, do you have a plan for upcoming shows, uh, physical shows? Yeah, yeah, of course. Of so course. When is the next, when would you planning the next show? You so think? the next show, um, we were going to show Manal al Doyan, and that is our... Um, she recently joined the gallery, I mean, a yes. year and a half ago. So we've been working on that show for more than a year. But the um, idea that she might not be able to attend and, the, you know, there were not ideal, optimal conditions. So this is now postponed to November. And uh, we are now working on another, another show. Uh, and then, yeah, just a regular program, we'll I think, there. four or five four or five shows ahead. We know about four or five shows ahead of the present show. Isabel, thank you. We hope to have you back uh, on the show soon. Sure. And uh, don't lay low. No, no, we are like <laughs> up in there. Good, good, great. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to the Lighthouse Conversations with me, Hesha Montasser. We're produced by Chirag Desai, and our content director is Farah Sharif. Make sure not to miss any future episodes by going to your favorite podcast player like Apple or Spotify and clicking on the subscribe button. We'll see you in two weeks.